We'll rise up as we pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we bless your name for the Bible study. Thank you for bringing us here to save us and sanctify us and fill us with the Holy Spirit. I will thank you for the demand of holiness in our lives. And we we'll pray, Lord, that you help us to have the mind of Christ, that what pleases you will desire will passionately seek after in Jesus name and we're asking Lord that uh, the study of your word will prepare us for heaven and whenever Christ will come we'll be ready for that coming day in Jesus name help us Lord to be wise unto salvation and to set a mind on things on high and not things on earth help us Lord to look at your word Apply your word to our hearts, and when there is conviction, we pray. We will not dodge the conviction of the word. It will drive us to our knees. And we will pray and be what we ought to be. Because, Lord, matured people, not babies and not superficial people, not novices, that do not regard the word of God seriously. Help us, Lord, to see what you are telling us today. Hear what you are telling us. And apply our hearts to wisdom. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. I welcome everyone to the Bible study tonight. As we look at the Bible study tonight, we are looking at one verse. And I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 11 verse 32. It says, And what shall I most say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, and of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. The first thing you notice here is that this verse contains six names and a general title of the prophets. As we compare the verse with all the other verses that were studied in the epistle to the Hebrews, you find in chapter 11, verse 4, it talks about Abel. And the whole verse is devoted to Abel. You come to verse 5, he's talking about Enoch. And the whole verse is talking about Enoch. And then verse 7 about Noah. In verses 8 through 10, we have Abraham. And then we have Sarah. Then we come back to Abraham again. But the point is this. That you have each of those patriarchs, each of those personalities, each of those people. They have either a verse or more to themselves. But as you come to verse 32, as the apostle is rounding up, he says, What shall I more say? I have a lot of people I say could tell you about. That's what the apostle is saying. Because faith is so important. In fact, it tells us in verse 6, look at verse 6, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. And that's not only in the New Covenant, even in the Old Covenant. It's not only in the New Testament, even in the Old Testament. It's not only for contrary, contemporary people. It's for the people of the past too. That any time, every time, in the ages past, in the ages of this present time, and in the eras to come, the epoch to come, that if you're going to please the Lord, it must be by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's what the apostle says. I could talk of other people. Elijah is not mentioned here. Elisha is not mentioned here. Job is not mentioned here. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and all these prophets are not mentioned by name. And he could have mentioned any of them. That's why he says, what shall I more say? The time would fail me to go one after the other, but I'll talk about Gideon, and I'll talk about Barak. I'll reveal about something about Jephthah and David and Samuel and then of the prophets too. Because of uh, the many names and because of the ground we have to cover, tonight we're just going to concentrate on four of them. We're going to concentrate on the first four. That means we'll talk about Gideon, we'll talk about uh, Barak, we'll talk about Samson, and we'll talk about Jephthah, and we're going to reserve the rest of the names till the following study. 
by the grace of God, uh, next Monday, if Jesus tarries, we'll talk about David and talk about Samuel and talk about the prophets. But as you look at what we are looking at today, what we are studying today, we're talking about winning in warfare by faith. Winning in warfare by faith. We need to apply our hearts to wisdom. We're not fighting the same battle that Gideon fought. We're not fighting the same battle that Jephthah fought. We're not fighting the same battle that David fought or that Samson fought or that any of those people of old that they fought. But we're in the same warfare. It's the same devil, but it's another strategy. And that's why you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 3. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We do not fight after the flesh. In fact, that already tells you that we're not fighting the way something fought. We're not fighting the way Gideon fought. Neither are we fighting the way Jephthah fought or the way any of the other people fought. How are we fighting? We're fighting by faith. And it is a faith that is single out in their lives. It's not their weapon. Our weapons are different. It's not their style. Our styles are different. And it's not the enemy they fought. We're not fighting the Philistines today. We're not fighting the Midianites today. We're not fighting the Amalekites today. There is something we're fighting to. The good fight of faith. Therefore, we take principles out of what they did. And then we apply those principles. We're not just to import them or export them into our lives. Because things are different. Look at verse 4. It says in verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons of our warfare are not natural. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. They are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strong holes. If David spoke about strongholds, he'll have something physical in mind. When the New Testament believers talks about strongholds, he has something spiritual, something deadly in mind. And he says, casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So right there you see that the fight we fight is different. The warfare we have is different. But the principles are there all the same. That's why it tells us in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 10, it tells us how to get ready, how to prepare ourselves, how to arm ourselves so that we can have the victory and we'll have the victory in Jesus' name. By the way, as we look at all these the people of the Old Testament, they also had some areas of warfare. That they were not thinking about. We'll come to them one by one. You will see. They looked out. And they saw the external enemy. They looked out of themselves. And they saw the Philistines out there. But they didn't see the flesh in here. They didn't see the imaginations in here. And the various thoughts in here. They didn't see the temptations they had. And they did overcome those temptations, some of them. They just talked about the Philistines, about the Amalekites, about the Midianites, and about the Assyrians and the Egyptians, and all the other people. The New Testament is different. It's saying, look inward. Look at your life. Look at your flesh. And look at the world around you. And look at your family. And see the real warfare you are engaged in so that you win the victory. If you win the victory over sin, if you win the victory over self, if you win the victory over Satan, if you win the victory over evil spirits and demons, if you win the victory over the practices of the world, you win the victory over the things that the world is uh, labeling or that is uh, throw, throwing at you. Then you've got the victory. That's why it says, reading from chapter 6 of verse 10 Ephesians, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's how we're going to win. We're going to win. And it says, put on the whole armor of God, that she may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's what we're fighting today. The wiles of the devil. The plans of the devil. The strategy of the devil. The, the, all the opinions and the ideas of the devil to bring us down. 
and to send us away from the path, the narrow path that leads to heaven, and then he wants to pull us down to hell with himself. That's his goal today. It's not setting Amalekites after us today. It's not sending Philistines after us today. It's not sending the Midianites against us today. It sends another theme. It's darts. It's arrows. It's words. It tells us in verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. What's flesh and blood? Amalekites, flesh and blood. Canaanites, flesh and blood. Jebusites, flesh and blood. And then all those uh, Philistines, their flesh and blood. Egyptians, Assyrians, that's uh, flesh and blood. But our fight is the same. Our warfare is different, rather. Our warfare is different. For we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. If the devil can turn your eyes away from those principalities and powers and they can fight you without even you resisting and you're looking at Amalekites and then you're preparing and you want to fight all those Canaanites and you want to have a, your victory over the Philistines and Egyptians and the Assyrians the devil will be very happy because he has distracted you to fight the wrong enemy it makes you to fight flesh and blood and the real enemy you are not able to fight you don't have any resistance any opposition and they will defeat you but if you know who you are fighting if you know what you are fighting if you know the battle that you are engaged in today and then you take all these principles out of the teaching of the word of God and then you fight the proper enemy then you will win the victory I said you will win the victory that's why it says in verse 13 it says wherefore take unto you the whole amount of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand stand therefore having your loins got about your truth and having you know, on the breastplate of righteousness have you seen something here it says you don't need the five stones and the sling of David anymore you don't need the sword of Saul anymore you don't need the jawbone of an ass that something used anymore now you need the belt of truth you need the armor of God. And it says in verse 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about your truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. It says he'll throw darts at you. Your thoughts, your mind, your opinions, the ideas, the arrows coming from the world through the devil, and it is poison. It wants to poison your mind and poison your thoughts and makes you look the wrong direction, makes you think of the wrong thing, makes you do the wrong thing. And then you say, No, I know my armor, and I know the way to fight. And then you fight and you win. And it says, And you take the shield of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit can you see this it says you pray if you're going to win it's not just pray you pray in the spirit the Holy Ghost has seized your spirit and your soul and your mind and the words are gushing out it's not that if you're reading from a paper you're reading the prayer from a book somebody has written all this down if you're going to pray read this one seven times that's not praying in the spirit you know that that's just carnality and that's just a religion you know that doesn't work at all but he says if you're going to win the victory that you will pray with all kinds of prayer praying on the promises praying on the commandments praying for grace and praying for the power of god and praying for you to be able to stand praying that you have a backbone you'll stand in the day of trouble and in the day of trial all kinds of prayer and supplication praying in the spirit your spirit praying and praying according According to the Holy Ghost with groanings that cannot be uttered. And then he goes on to say, watching thereunto with all persever perseverance and supplication for all saints. That's how to win the victory. I am going to win the victory. First Timothy chapter 1. 
in first timothy chapter one i'm reading from verse eight it says this charge i commit unto thee son timothy according to the prophecies which went before on thee that thou by them mightest war a good warfare it says you are not going to look at the weapons of david and the weapons of samson and the weapons of gideon and the weapons of Barak, and then fight with the same weapon and say this is a weapon david carried and that's the weapon david carried i'm going to use exactly the same thing it says no the proclamations on you the prophecies on you the promises on you that gives you confidence god said so i believe it and it will happen exactly that way the victory he has promised us the triumph he has promised us that's what the lord is telling us that yes they had warfare and in their own time in their own dispensation the weapons that was appropriate with their dispensation that one they use in our own time now in our own dispensation now in our own age and epoch now the weapons that are appropriate for our own a kind of a covenant and our own kind of dispensation that is what we use in verse 19 holding faith and a good conscience which some having put away concerning faith have made a sheep red and so as we come to the study of today you want to understand how Paul the apostle writing to the Hebrew believers how he encouraged them and look at the names he gives over here he pierced them like in twos we're coming to Hebrews chapter 11 and we're reading from verse 30 to what shall I more say for the time will fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak you've noticed something there Barak actually read led before Gideon but in writing now he interchanges them he mentions Gideon first and then he mentions Barak later and then he goes to the next two look at the next two and of Samson and of Jephthah actually Jephthah also ruled and judged the children of Israel before Samson in fact Jephthah had even gone and died had gone to glory before Samson was ever born and yet Samson was mentioned first and Jephthah was mentioned later why is that like that it is like that for you to understand it's not talking of permit me to use the words chronology that is the time it's not looking at the time this one came before this and that one came before that and that one came before that all he wants to do is just to tell you that these people they watch and they fought by faith the same thing we apply today in our personal lives there are times that maybe we're mentioning people we say uh, brother so and so sister so and so it may be that brother so and so came much later after sister so and so you don't get offended you don't say well they mentioned him before me how they mentioned her before me what did they uh, emphasize what he has done before what i have done i came before him yes we understand yes we know even in the bible gideon and then Barak. Even in the Bible, then Samson and then Jephthah. Look at this David and then Samuel. It was Samuel that anointed David to be king. And David was certainly an adult, a prophet before David before david ever came on, on board but all the same david was mentioned before some before samuel so that means then as you come to church and then maybe this is the area of your work that's the area of your work and we're giving kind of commendation appreciation and we're thanking the people and we're praising god for them or maybe we're leading prayer and in our leading prayer we're praying for this section god bless them they are contributing a lot that other section praise the lord they are contributing a lot and we mention some people before we even mention you later and then you say why that how could they do that don't they understand i've been in this place for a long time just like it was in the bible let's become scriptural we're deep alive bible church no offense in fact there are some people here that are not mentioned and if you were to think about think about job the face that job had i know that my redeemer liveth and even though this uh, disease may destroy my warm my, my skin yet in my flesh i shall see the lord whom i shall see for myself and he prayed for his friends he prayed in faith and god healed his friends and god multiplied everything that he had is not mentioned here look at elijah 
that great man of uh, fire and of power according to my word there shall be no dew or rain all these years a man of faith look at elisha the man with the double portion is not even mentioned here and i say even though i say it's referred to but not mentioned directly so sometimes other people are mentioned when we are either making an announcement or we are doing whatever we are doing and then they mention them and you are waiting I hope they will mention my name I hope if they don't mention my name at least they will give some description that will show that I am important of course you are important of course you are significant but the name was, was not mentioned the names were not mentioned here therefore we don't take any offense we just say praise the lord that's how the spirit is leading and as we learn all these things i pray we'll apply them to our lives in jesus name but we we'll come back to the study now it's by faith that he did all that he did it's by faith they won all their victories it's by faith they were able to overcome and by, by that same faith we're going to overcome in jesus Jesus name we're going to look at uh, four parts of four people today number one we look at Gideon number two we're going to look at Barak number three we're going to look at Samson and number four we're going to look at Jephthah we're looking at the uh, Gideon number one winning with the courageous few winning with the courageous few even though they were few just 300 yet they won it's not the number it's the power of god behind the few it's the power of god in partnership with the few it's the power of god supporting the few and if god is for us who can be against us we will win the battle number two is Barak weapon against cruel foes those people are very wicked that leveled uh, their power against Barak at the time of the judges but all the same he won the victory and he's telling us that no matter how great your enemy might be no matter how forceful or how furious or how cruel or wicked they may be you will have the victory all we need is faith in God because one with God is in the majority and we know that his power cannot fail and the Lord Jesus Christ said I am with you until the end of the world in the storms of life in the battles that rage he'll be with you he'll be with us we'll win the victory and then we we'll come to something that is weakness overcome by conquering faith you know the story of something and yet eventually on the final finally he overcame and uh, whatever has happened in the past is not the important thing what's happening from now on as you put your faith in christ that's the important thing and you are going to win the victory and then we'll come to jephthah the willingness with consecrated faithfulness even though he had circumstances around him that were not of his making yet he overcame there might be circumstances around you that you feel i hope things i, I wish things were different but they are not different the way they are even in that your condition your situation you will still overcome i said you will still overcome let's look at them one by one now we're coming to hebrews chapter 11 and we're reading from verse 32 it says and what shall i more say for the time will fail me to tell of gideon we come to gideon and this is the gideon that won a great battle against uh, people that were many in fact it says they were innumerable they cover the land as if you couldn't count them and yet by faith he won and the important thing here is that the people he had to work with him they were very very few i want you to look at judges chapter 7 after he after he had been called of god and the lord has said go forth mighty man valiant man in days your strength and your might and he said am i valiant am i powerful am i mighty if i were mighty and you're going to give the victory through us i bought all these midianites against us and i bought all the miracles that were read about from our fathers we're not seeing any miracles today that's what he was saying how can i win and the lord encouraged him and after some doubts were cleared and he put the fleece here if the water will be there if the deer will be there if this other part will be dry and not have 
part will be dry after the Lord settled his doubts. He was ready to go out now and he blew the trumpet. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And with that power of the Spirit of God, he was ready now to move on. It is the same thing in your life with the power of the Spirit of God. You're saved, you're sanctified, and you are now baptized and due with power from on high, baptized in the Holy Ghost. You're ready for battle. I said you are ready for battle because you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria to the uttermost part of the earth anywhere you find yourself with God on your side and with the Spirit of God upon your life you will win the battle. We're looking at chapter 7 of Judges, Judges chapter 7. In Judges chapter 7 I'm reading from verse 1, Judges chapter 7 and we're reading from verse 1 and Jeroboam, who is Gideon and all the people that were with him went up early and pitched beside the well of Herod so that the hosts of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Mori in the valley and the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to uh, for me uh, for me to give the Midianites into thine hand, lest Israel shall vaunt proud pride themselves, uh, saying against me, saying our saying that my own hand have saved me. You see, the many people just showed up, 32,000 people showed up. When Gideon made the call, and the Lord said, there are too many. There are people that put their faith in the multitude, instead of putting their faith in God. And then the multitude will be a kind of bragging, is because we are many. Why it not for us? He couldn't have won the battle. And instead of giving the glory to God, he gave to the multitude. But the Lord said, there are too many. Therefore, in verse 2, Three. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gid from Mount Gilead. And their return of the people, how many people? Twenty two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. And there are many people that when such things happen, their hearts will sink. It's like all the important people that are fighting the battle, they are gone. Are we depending on men or are we depending on God? It's the actions of people that will show you whether you are depending on God or you are depending on those men. When they say, we cannot support anymore, we are not with you anymore, and we cannot go along with you anymore. And the majority of the people that were singing your praise and were shouting, he is our leader, he is our commander, he is, our, he is the conqueror, and we are going along with him. And the multitude, they draw back, and they say they cannot follow. If you are still standing at that time, it means that your confidence is in God. 10,000 remain, and God even said, even the 10,000 were still too many. Look at verse 4. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many to uh, bring them down into the water, and I will try them. I will test them for thee there. And then it goes on to say, and it shall be that of whom I shall say, they shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say, they shall not go go with thee. The same shall not go. You know the story he brought them to the riverside and then the people, they just bent down. I don't know whether when I'll see water to drink again and they drank and drank and drank. But there were 300 people and these 300 they latched the water as dogs. That is uh, their mind, their eyes were focused on the battle ahead of them. 
What's the Lord telling us? It's not telling us that, uh, you know, we'll go on to the riverside and lap the water like they lap the water. It's just telling us about their commitment. And it's saying, whatever battle you have, if you're focused on the Lord, you're focused on the word of God, you're focused on the assignment, on the duty that the Lord has given you, and your mind is not on what to do to please yourself, what to do to God yourself, and to, to be greedy of this and of that, and you just set your mind on the assignment the Lord has given you. That's what he's teaching us there, that these were, number one, they were converted people. Number two, they were consecrated people. Number three, they were courageous people. What we're learning from them, these few, is that, number one, you must be so converted that your past life and your past duty and your past uh, desires, they're not important anymore. The only thing that's important now is the call of God. Is the assignment of God. It's the duty God has given you. There's so much conversion. You are not thinking of yourself anymore. You're not thinking of convenience anymore. You're not thinking of your pleasure anymore. These 300 few people, number one, they were converted. Number two, they were committed. They were consecrated. All they wanted to do is, I'll serve the Lord. I'll go into this battle. It doesn't matter the hardship doesn't matter the difficulty not doesn't matter the need in my life it doesn't matter i've got this i've not got that i've got this i've got this or whatever that doesn't matter my concentration my consecration is just on the work of the lord that's what the lord is saying number one converted number one, number two consecrated number three courageous that even after the other people have gone back and you remain with only 300 and then you look at the field of the median nights and they fill the whole place and the courage is still in your heart and you say whatever comes whatever goes whoever supports whoever does not support the 300 of gideon we're going to overcome that's what the lord is telling us and i pray that there will be real conversion in your life you see without conversion we cannot do much you can, when there's no battle, you can brag, you can promise like Peter, I'll follow you, I will die with you no matter what happens. Other people may deny you. I will never deny you before the battle arrives. When the battle arrives is when we know, number one, the converted people. Number two, we know the consecrated people. Number three, we know the courageous people. Look at verse 7. And the Lord said unto Gideon, by these 300 men that large will i save you and deliver the midianites into thine hand and let all the other people go every man unto his place and the other people went back and the 300 a few people they went on i will move on i said i'm moving on You'll move on in Jesus' name. But let me tell you the secret of that victory. We'll come to chapter 6 and verse 34. Chapter 6, verse 34. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. That's the victory. And that's the secret. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Gideon. The others who are still going to study, you'll find it seems saying that they are, that gave him the victory. Chapter 11, verse 29. Chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 29. Again, you'll find something here. What gave them the victory? Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. 11, 29. It says in verse 29, Then the spirit of the Lord came upon who there? Upon Jephthah. That's how they won the victory. You must be saved. Because the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, cannot come and live, cannot come and dwell, or somebody is not saved. If the blind lead the blind, both of them will fall into the ditch. But you allow the Spirit of God to bring conviction of sin in your life, and to bring conversion, total conversion, a real change, and then to bring commitment. And then you are sanctified, because sanctification makes you holy within Holy in your mind, holy in your heart, holy in your spirit, holy in your thought, holy in everything, your desires, your aspiration. There is holiness, holiness unto the Lord because he is 
Holy Spirit. And because it's the Holy Spirit, He wants to dwell in His sanctified heart. And then after that, you are saved and you are sanctified. In the New Testament era, there is, a, there is an experience called the baptism in the Holy Ghost. He envelops you in the power of the Holy Ghost. He induces you with the power of the Holy Ghost. He anoints you with the power of the Holy Ghost. He immerses you in the river of the Holy Ghost. And then the Spirit of God is within you. It's around you. It's upon you. And it's supporting you. And it is when you are surrounded like that, saturated like that, with the power of the Holy Ghost, you will have the victory. You will win the victory. In Judges chapter 14. Look at chapter 14. We're reading about another one now. So you know that their faith in God made the Spirit of God to be abundant in their lives. Chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. That's talking about Samson. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. In 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're reading from verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren and the spirit of the Lord came upon David. You see that? All these men were reading about that, what shall I say more? What shall I more say? For the time will fill me to, to, to tell of Gideon, of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jezza, and of David, and of Samuel, and of the prophets also. They were filled with the Spirit, saturated with the Spirit. And it's the power of the Spirit that moved them on. How much can you do in the kingdom of God? How much can you amount to without that Spirit of the living God empowering and doing and, and uh, overcoming, immersing you completely? Be converted. Be consecrated. Be courageous. We'll pass on to number two now. Barak. Weapon against cruel force. We come to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 32. Hebrews 11, reading from verse 32. Here the apostle says, that's the writer, the author of this epistle. He says, and what shall I more say? For the time will fail me to tell of number one, Gideon, and number two of Barak. This is the Barak that uh, lived uh, in the time of the judges, very early. You see the children of Israel, they were falling and rising, falling and rising, falling and rising. They had repeated cycles of sinning. They'll sin, and then they'll suffer, then they'll make supplication, then they'll have salvation. After that salvation and security, then they go back to sin again, and then there will be suffering, and then there will be supplication, and then salvation, security again. Then they go back again. The cycle just went on. And because of that, they suffered a lot. Uh, look at uh, Judges uh, chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. And see the condition of the children of Israel at that time falling and rising and as some people like that today they do not uh, make too much uh, of the blood of jesus christ of the grace of god of the power of calvary and the power of the cross it's like uh, they say i'm saved i'm born again the evidence is not there the power to live a, a conquering life and to live a courageous life and to live a life of conviction is not there a little temptation they're gone they're gone back in to sin. A little trial, a little persecution, the, the, the jaws they cringe and, and they crumble. You cannot find them standing. Standing in faith and standing in victory and standing in triumph. Just like the children of Israel. But it should not be like that. And it will not continue like that. I said it will not continue like that. Uh, look at the experience in Judges chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 11. Judges chapter 2, verse 11. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served barely. They were delivered. And then look at verse 20. And the anger of the Lord was hot against, the, against Israel. And he said, because that these people have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice. I also will not henceforth drive out any 
be from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. Look at chapter 3 verse 8. In chapter 3 verse 8 it says, Therefore the anger of the Lord was fought against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of, uh, of that uh, king. You see, in their lives they were just, you know, down, up, up, down, up, down, like that. They didn't have the victory, but uh, the Lord wants us to overcome sin overcome disobedience overcome all the temptations that the people of the world or that the flesh or, or or the devil may throw at us at the time that Barak came up the children of israel were back again into their backsliding and because of that they were suffering and the lord raised up this barak we're looking at uh, chapter 4 reading from chapter 4 now we're looking at verse 4 and deborah a prophetess the wife of lapidoth she judged israel at that time and she dwelt under the palm tree of uh, deborah uh, between ramah and bethel in mount ephraim and the children of israel came up to her for judgment and then in verse 5 and she sent and called Barak the son of Abinoam out of Kadesh Naphtali and said unto him as not the Lord God of Israel commanded saying go and draw toward Mount and they draw toward Mount Tabor and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun and I will draw unto thee uh, unto the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitudes and I will deliver him into thy hand that's the most important sentence there I will deliver him into thy hand and when God says I will don't look at your weakness anymore. He said, I will. Don't look at your past and lack of experience. He said, I will. Don't look at the power of the enemy. I will. Don't look at the enormity or the size, the magnitude of your problem. He said, I will. It will not fail you. It will not disappoint you. What he said he will do, he will do. He will not fail in Jesus' name. What does the Bible say? Faith come by, comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Here is the word of God that came out already from the very mind of God, the very heart of God, and the word of God told him that he will be with him and he will surely give him the victory. All the promises of God are yes and amen in your life. And those promises will be fulfilled to the letter in Jesus' name. When you pass through the waters, he'll be with you. Through the fire, the fire will not burn you. And whatever it is, no weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper in Jesus' name. Every tongue that tries to stop against you in judgment, you will condemn. That's the word of the Lord, is the heritage of the people of God. God will not fail you, and you will not fail God. And look at First Peter chapter First Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter two. We're not fighting the Midianites today. Here is what we're what we're fighting. First Peter chapter two verse eleven. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. Don't think about the Midianites, about the Amorites, about the Ammonites, about the Jebusites, about the Canaanites. Think about the fleshly lusts, the temptations that come against you. And that's the thing that fights against your soul, war against your soul, and they want to defeat you, but you will not be defeated. The power of the Lord will sustain you, and the Spirit of the Lord will see you through in Jesus' name. We'll come to number three now. What shall I most say? For the time will fail me to tell of Gideon, number one, and to tell of Barak, number two, and to tell of Samson, number three. We come to this, number three, Samson, weakness overcome by conquering faith. Weakness overcome by conquering faith. You know that in the case of Samson, uh, that his birth was prophesied by an angel that appeared unto the mother. 
and eventually the after the mother told her husband the husband uh, also uh, pleaded that uh, god will send that angel to them so that he would hear by himself and the lord did that and eventually uh, samson was born what's the secret of the power of samson what's the secret of the courage of samson and what's the secret of the exploits of samson we're looking at judges chapter 13 in Judges chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 24. Judges chapter 13, verse 24. And the, the woman bear a son and called his name Samson. And uh, the child grew. And the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him uh, at times in uh, the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtown. Uh, all the victory that he had is attributed to the power of the Spirit of God. He had so much power. He was a special person. And he was a judge in Israel. And a special task of fighting against the Philistines was his. He is remembered most, of course, for his moral failure, his moral weakness, his backsliding, and loss of God's power. Yet his last exploit of faith shows that you overcame that weakness by faith. Whatever your past, I pray that the victory to overcome from now on, the Lord will grant unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. Despite the failure, in spite of that failure, he eventually had conquering faith. And throughout his life, he fought. He fought and defeated thousands of the Philistines single-handedly. He didn't say, I don't have a prayer partner, therefore I can't overcome. Of course you can overcome. If God be with you, who can be against you? I don't know whether people are praying for me or not. I heard that uh, the only way you can succeed in life and succeed in the family and succeed in the ministry is if you have some uh, intercessors who are dedicated to praying for you day and night. Day and night. Well, we have people in the Bible, they didn't have all those necessities, praying for them day and night, and yet they overcame. With Jesus on your side, you will overcome. Amen. With the promises of God that are yes and amen, you will overcome in Jesus' name. But uh, we need to talk about uh, this something, and we need to talk about what brought him down. Because if we don't know what brought such great men, such mighty men, such powerful men, what brought them down? How are we going to overcome ourselves? And when those challenges come to us, the same challenges they come to us, how do we know how we're going to overcome? And let's see the problem actually of Samson before we talk about uh, his exploits of faith eventually, how he came out eventually. But first of all, what was his major problem? Look at chapter 16 of Judges. I'm reading from verse 6 and verse 7. Chapter 16 of Judges, we're looking at verse 6. And Delilah said unto Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Number one, it shouldn't have had any kind of contact, any kind of interaction any kind of intimacy any kind of friendship any kind of acquaintance with delilah because he was an israelite not only that he was a special israelite in nazareth not only that he was the judge he was a leader there are things leaders don't do there are places leaders don't go there are friends leaders don't keep and there are situations leaders don't get into because as a leader he should know that everybody was watching him and if you're a leader in the midst of the people of god they are watching everybody is watching he shouldn't have had that contact with delilah not only that uh, it was uh, the delilah was uh, asking question what's the secret of your strength it's not even told the children of Israel that is leading. When somebody who is a Christian, somebody who is a believer, a real child of God, he has uh, confidence in the world. 
He has friends in the world. And the people of the world, they know more about him than even the people in the fold, in the flock, in the Christian circle. That's a terrible thing. And they look at verse 7. And uh, Samson said unto her, If they bind me with seven green weeds that were never dried, then I shall be weak and be as another man. Of course, that was a lie. And there are people that think, you know, it doesn't really matter. After all, she is gentle. Telling a lie to a gentle, what does that matter? Telling a lie is telling a lie. Whether you are telling a lie to an apostle or to a prophet, to a Christian or to a gentle, to your friend in the world, a friend in the church, the same thing. A lie is a lie. Something told a lie. And, uh, but surprisingly, the power was still there. I said surprisingly, you know, for people who are surprised, but don't be surprised. Now, for example, you find fans that are walking in, uh, in the auditorium. And in the auditorium, where those who are in the Bible study now, you are listening, there, is, uh, there, is, there may be a fan walking there. If you switch off the light and the power is gone, because the fan had been rotating and rolling, it will still, still keep on rolling. And at high speed for that matter and then it keeps on rolling and rolling if you turn on the power again then it will have full speed turn it off again it will still keep on rolling and eventually it will keep on like that until the effect the residue of the power that is was in that fan before until everything dies down and the motion stops then you will know that the power had been up but the power really had been off while the fan was still moving many people don't understand that they think well i'm still preaching of course you're still preaching all the verses you had in your memory before they are still there even though the spirit of god is no more there the lie has come the backsliding has come the sin has come in of course you can still call some verses and because you have been preaching before you have been doing something before you can still go on but it's not that the power the electric power is gone and the dynamic power is gone the holy ghost is gone but you need to know that look at verse 10 in verse uh, sorry in verse 10 and delilah said unto Samson, behold thou has mocked me and told me lies. Unbeliever telling a leader in Israel, telling a Nazarite, telling a consecrated person, saying, you have told me lies, now tell me. I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, if they bind me fast with new robes, that never were occupied, then I shall be weak and be as another man. But something, why are you playing with the power? I shall be weak and be as another man. I shall be weak and be as another man. He thought, well, the power is always there. Some people think like that, you know. The position is always there. The recognition is always there. The honor is always there. The ability is always there. I know myself. When I'm ready, I'll get back to God, God again. I'll connect again and see something wonderful will happen. You will deceive yourself until everything is gone. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, and Delilah said unto Samson, He that too, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. When you find a woman that is so persistent, wanting to bring you down, why don't you run away? A woman that uh, you even lied to, and she said, you're still lying, but I will not leave you. I'm going to hang on to you until I bring you down. Until I make all the power in your life to go, I'm not going to leave you. I will keep on asking you. You tell me lies, I will ask you again, and I will not let you go. I'm bound to you. I'm a gentile. The enemies are behind me and they want me to find out the secret of your strength and the secret of your power. And I'm going to hook you to myself and hook myself to you. I will bring you down. And this leader in Israel, he did not check himself. He didn't wake up. He still went on like that. Are you so much intimate with somebody in the world? A man in the world, a woman in the world. And you know, your conscience tells you, your mind tells you, your spirit is telling you, you are going, 
you are going and you are no more as attached to the Lord, as intimate to the Lord as you were. It's like if you don't see this person, if you don't talk to this person, if you don't hear from this person in a day, even though you know they are wrecking you, they are ruining you, they are destroying your life. And they're bringing you down spiritually yet you are so attached to them that if i don't talk to them you don't feel that it's you must still call them in these days of uh, gsm that you know phoning 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 talking 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 and you're calling the wrong person you're calling the person who wants to take you away from god and away from christian faith away from christian experience and away from heaven and yet you are bent on backsliding I pray God will help you today. And Elilah said in verse 13 unto Samson, He that too, thou hast mocked me and told me lies, tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head and with the web, and then goes on and on. I want you to look at verse 15 now. In verse 15, and she said unto him, How canst thou say, I love thee? thee you shouldn't love israel love me don't love your assignment love me don't love your calling love me don't love your, your ministry love me don't love your church people love me don't love a wife love me i'm attaching myself to you i'll bring you down love me and destroy yourself by loving me and do whatever I want you to do, even though it drags you to hell. That's love. That's Delilah's definition of love. You say you love me, I love thee, when thine heart is not with me. I want your heart. You're keeping your heart somewhere else. Give me your heart. Don't give your heart to God or give your heart to religion or give your heart to your calling or give your heart to your ministry or give your heart to what God has appointed for you to do before you were born. I have come now, let me replace all that portion and all the position, all the privileges. Let me, let me replace that in your life. What a pity for some sin. And as that, thou hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily. And something kept talking every day. He won't talk to daddy. Won't talk to mommy. Won't talk to any Israelite. Won't talk to any counselor. Won't talk to any companion. Won't talk to anybody that has faith in God. Kept on talking to Delilah every day. And the woman kept on pressing. Kept on pressing. And then it says... Uh, daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death that he told her all his heart the die is cast and is cast in concrete that means now the man is down what was the problem talking too much talking tongue talkativeness Talk, talk, talk. Talk, talk, talk. And they lose their mind. They lose their senses. They lose their conviction by just talking. What did something lose? Look at verse 20. And then when the enemies came in verse 20, and she said, The Philistines be upon thee something. Wait. These people of the world, they know their goal. She was actually working for money. The Philistines have, pl have their planned and promised her, if you can tell the secret, find out the secret and tell us, we'll give you so much amount of money. And this man in Nazareth, a person that had been prophesied before he was even born, he couldn't tell, he couldn't say that this is for his death. It was dangerous. There are some people like that in the offices. And once they see that woman, the unbelieving woman, the one that always, I will go to lunch with you. I will go and eat with you. I just like you. Even if I don't eat, just looking at you eating, that satisfies me. Delilah, get out of that place. You didn't say amen. Yeah. Ah, you love your Delilah. You don't want them to go. I said Delilah, get out of that place. 
you know we labor we pray we get converted we get saved we get sanctified we get baptized in holy ghost and then yeah, we, we, we labor we teach we counsel we do everything and then one delilah somewhere in your office will take your mind away and take your heart away all this that we're hearing and we search the word and we preach the word and we dig into the word just to help you to stand but the light, light is so powerful in your life that man is so powerful in your life that woman is so powerful in your life that they take you away from the conviction built in your heart in what you are hearing this man something he fell look at that verse 20 and she said the Philistines be upon this something and he awoke out of his sleep and said I will go out as at other times and shake myself uh -uh. and he wished not he knew not that the Lord was departed from him he knew not that the Lord was departed from him but you understand what brought his problem talking if you can control that tongue, if you can check that tongue, if you can put some beat, some check on that tongue, if you can swallow those words, if you can just keep quiet for some time, if you can meditate, if you can think through and say this person that is so putting much pressure on me, texting me every time, and want phoning me every time, wanting to talk to me every time, doesn't she have another thing to do? Am I the only person on earth? She's always thinking about, he's always thinking about, think about that. They want to bring you down. They want to destroy you. I pray you'll keep your tongue. And I pray you'll keep your mouth. What did Sam Silas? Number one, he lost the spirit. He lost the spirit. Number two, he lost his seal, the sign. Because the cut of the air, that's a sign of anointing for him. It's a sign of authority for him. It's a sign of divine appointment for him. The seal of anointing, the seal of authority, and the seal of appointment, he lost that. He lost the spirit, number one. He lost the seal, number two. He lost his strength, number three. His strength was gone. I will lose my strength. I'll be like another man. He became like another man. Think about that. The glory you have now. The unction you have now. The anointing you have now. The power you have now. And some people are so jealous in a, in a, in a positive way that they'll give anything to have the unction you have. And to have the power you have. And that's why Elisha said, I mean, looking at Elijah, you're asking me what I want. I want a double portion of your spirit other people are looking at something if i could get a fraction of what he had he lost his strength he lost his sight those philistines got him and they kind of uh, plugged out his two eyes they made him blind he lost his sight and where there is no vision the people perish here is the judge of israel here is the leader of israel no vision again no sight again and the people of israel now will perish who will fight their battles for the sake of the people god raised you up for that you will minister to them you can't deny yourself from this intimacy interaction and friendship with delilah and think about you have a call upon your life you have a commission upon your life and you have a heaven to gain you have a hell to shun he lost the spirit he lost the seal he lost his strength he lost his sight he lost his security no more security now. The Philistines just came and they took him and whisked him away and put him in a dungeon. Put him in a place of captivity. He lost his security. That's not all. He lost his self-respect. Lost his self-respect. Self-esteem is very important. Self-respect is very important. And when you find somebody at a Christian that everybody in your place of work, they're gossiping about you. They're talking behind you. That man and Delilah, we know them. We know what they're doing. The people of Israel, they don't know. 
His daddy doesn't know, his mommy doesn't know, but we know, we know what they're doing. And even Delilah will come and say, guess who is in my life now? Guess who I'm working with? And guess who I am moving with? You know, the greatest person in the nation of Israel, the, high, the number one person in the land of Israel. That's who I'm, you know, contacting now. And, you know, we talk every time. And he comes to sleep over in my house. And, you know, I talk to him and ask him questions that nobody else in Israel can ask him. He lost his self-respect. Think about yourself. As you degrade yourself, demote yourself, and you lower yourself, and you talk, talk, talk to these people, although they are laughing with you, but they don't respect you. Although they are, you know, calling you, they don't respect you anymore. They saw that, you know, that man, that woman being deep alive, and deep alive people, holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. We didn't know they were so cheap. We didn't know that they are so common. We didn't know that they are so, you know, so much available that, you know, they can talk about this and talk. He doesn't even know me. He doesn't know my secret, but I know her secret. He doesn't know my secret, but I know his secret. He doesn't know anything. I hide myself. He doesn't know the Philistines are with me. He doesn't know what amount of money they promised me. This man is unintelligent. This man is not wise. I keep on asking him about his own secret. He didn't even have the sense to ask me, where are you coming from? Who sent you? Who are you contacting? Who are you telling stories to? And everything that happened between Samson and Delilah, he was reporting to the Philistines what, what a leader that was. I pray you'll not be in the cage of Delilah in Jesus' name. And if you're a woman, you'll not be in the cage of anybody, any man like Delilah in Jesus' name. You keep your self-respect. He lost the spirit. He lost the seal. He lost the strength. He lost also his sight. He lost the security. He lost the self-respect. He lost his superiority. He was superior to any man in Israel. That man could carry the gauge of his city and just carry it away. He was superior in power. He was superior in calling. He was superior in stature. He was superior in everything. Nobody came near him in the day of his power. That man was right on top there. Superiority. He lost all that. He came down to the level of Delilah. And he came below the level of Delilah. If you don't know what you have, you lose what you have. If you don't know the glory upon your life, you will lose that glory. If you don't know the honor upon your life, you will lose that honor. And you will lose the superiority. And people, they just see you like you are now. You are common. You are available. You are just, you are like everybody. Every dick and harry. You have lost the superiority because of talking, 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 talking. I pray you wake up. And you'll come back to where you ought to be in Jesus' name. Maybe you need to look at that uh, phone that you carry and delete those names from there and take up Delilah from there and all the text messages and wipe them away and just say tonight I'm making up my mind I'm taking a decision and those things will not be in my possession anymore the people you had as friends before before you were born again the people you had as confidence before before you were born again the people that were close to you before you now became a real child of God, a committed child of God, a converted child of God, a consecrated child of God, a courageous child of God, a commissioned child of God. You wipe all those things off because they're not important. They'll bring you down. You'll be trying to go up, trying to go up, and the moment they see you like this, they want to bring you down. And then you're talking. You're so used to talking to them that, you know, if that does not change, you'll never amount to real much in the kingdom of God. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. In the multitude of words, that's what I'm saying. In the multitude of words, something and Delilah, there wanteth not sin. Sin will be there. Lying will be there. Flattery will be there. Exaggeration will be there. The hypocrisy will be there. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 3, here it tells us, it says, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice, a fool's voice 
something lost spirit lost the seal lost the sign lost the strength lost the sight lost the security a fool's voice the fool he has lost self-respect he has lost superiority and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words chapter 10 of ecclesiastes i'm reading from verse 13 chapter 10 reading from verse 13 it says in verse 13 the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness and the end of his talk is mischievous madness a fool also is full of words and a man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him who can tell the lord has revealed all that to us so that will not be as foolish as something you'll not be foolish you'll not be unwise we come to the last person that we're going to study today i told you already we're going to concentrate on only four of them that is on gideon on barak on something and now on jephthah as we look at jephthah we see the willingness with consecrated faithfulness and the important thing we want to emphasize with uh, jephthah is uh, the fact that even though he had been uh, born uh, out of a uh, wedlock that he is and then the other children the family the, of the father did not accept him he had been uh, turned out of the home because actually he was uh, not uh, the son of a legitimate wife of the father and yet eventually when trouble arose in uh, the community they called him and then the spirit of the lord came upon him look at chapter 11 verse 29 and the spirit of the lord came upon Jephthah. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. That already can show whatever negative thing might have happened in his life before that time. And actually, his birth was not his fault. He wasn't, a, he wasn't in control of the father and the mother. Uh, before uh, the mother got uh, pregnant and before he was born. And so when he was born, he gave himself to the Lord, converted and then consecrated and consumed by the spirit of god the spirit of god came upon him and then he made a vow before the lord that if the lord will help him and support him and make him to have the victory he'll go to the battle and then he'll come back and he will offer something to the lord whatever meets him when he comes back look at verse 35 and it came to pass when he saw her, that is the daughter that came to meet her, that he wrenched his clothes and said, At last, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. That's the thing the Lord wants us to uh, learn. I have opened my mouth unto the Lord. The consecration, the commitment, the vow, the promise that he made unto the Lord. I have opened my mouth unto the Lord and I cannot go back. How many times have you opened your mouth unto the Lord after a Bible study? Lord, I understand what you are telling me. I'm going to do it. And then a week after, everything has changed. After the Sunday worship, oh Lord, this is what I'm going to, I see very clearly now. This is the demand of your word, of discipleship, demand of discipleship. After one month, you've gone back. But Jephthah said, I've opened my mouth unto the Lord. And I will not go back. And I pray that that same consecration commitment will be in your life in Jesus' name. And if you will do that, that, you know, you pray meaningful prayer, that you commit yourself to the Lord, and you are sold out to the Lord through and through, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, everything given to the Lord, and you stay by that vow, you stay by that promise, you stay by that consecration, you will grow exponentially. Your life will be beautiful, your life will be powerful and mighty for the Lord in Jesus' name. Look at uh, Psalm 15. In Psalm 15, I'm reading from verse 1 Lord who shall abide in thy tabernacle who shall dwell in thy holy hill he that walketh uprightly that walketh righteousness that speaketh the truth in his heart he that babacteth not with his tongue nor doeth evil to his neighbor nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor 
and it says in whose eyes a vile person is contained in whose eyes a vile person even though he's rich is contained a vile person even though he's somebody you have known for a long time familiar with but is contained but he honoreth them that fear the lord listen to this now this like jephthah he that swear to his own heart and changeth not he that swear to his own heart and changeth not those are the candidates for heaven they are not people that are given to change they are not people that you know today they're on top of a mountain in consecration and then tomorrow they're in the valley in compromise we're looking at a uh, proverbs chapter 24 and i'm reading from verse 21 proverbs chapter 24 reading from verse 21 my son fear thou the lord and the king and meddle not with them that are given to change. Meddle not with them that are given to change. Number one, if you find somebody who is, you know, like a chameleon, when in church, very serious. When in church, sanctimonious. When in church, very committed. But when outside, you meet them in the office, you meet them in the neighborhood, you meet them outside, different personality. They're giving to change. And therefore, it says, meddle not with them that are giving to change. You won't give your hand to those people, hand of fellowship. You say, no, I don't want to give encouragement to these people that are giving to change. Number two, somebody says, uh, you know, I want to marry you. I want you to have seen the will of God to you in marriage. And then you say, I'm still praying. And while you're still praying, he comes and he says, you know, although you've not given me answer, but you know, when we get married, we're going to do it like this and like this and like that. Are you not uh, uh, drinking the same water in deeper life? Are you not eating the same food? Are you not going to go the same direction? Ah, when we get married, just let us get married. Let's forget about that. But you know, I'm telling you that uh, there, there are things, uh, you know, it won't disturb you, but there are things uh, you are going to discover. I will change this i will change it meddle not with them that are giving to change don't even continue to pray because the fellow has told you that he is not stable he's not steadfast he's not solid he's not committed he's a compromiser and it's going to draw you away my son my daughter it says meddle not with them that are giving to change anybody that says i'm a counselor I'm a leader, I'm a teacher, I'm teaching you this, I'm teaching you this. And then when you talk to them and you say, Sir, what can I do about this sister, mommy? What can I do about this? Say, it's okay. Now if you want to listen to me, I'll tell you my mind. Don't go and tell group coordinator, tell pastor. Don't try it to the GS because this is private, this is my conviction. You know, this, this and this. You say, but that's different from what you are learning. I told you. I'm deeper like you, but I don't accept everything they say. I don't go by everything they say. Those are the people. Don't listen to a leader like that. He wants to send you to hell. He's on the way to hell himself. And he wants to pull you down from your conviction. And he's telling you, hey, come on. I've been in this scene before you were born. How old are you? Are you 21 or 22? I was in deeper life. I've been here for 30 years. And you were born 21, 22 years ago. Listen to me. This is how we practice it. We moderate everything. They're giving to change. You'll say, no. I'm not going to listen to a person like that. A person that is teaching. Teaching it. The district or teaching the locality and then as he's teaching then he will add something and when the group coordinator of the region of Asia will ask him brother how about say you taught like that don't you think that that's different from what we're all learning uh, yes i know it's different i did it deliberately i don't want to be a hypocrite that's what i believe internally and that's what i'm going to teach maybe will not with them that are giving to change such people will not have a microphone anymore whether a man or a woman that will that will deviate from the word of god and teach people to go contrary to the word of god we since we began we opened our mouth to the lord and we said we're going to teach everything and as it is as we come to church we don't come to entertain people we don't come to please people we come to preach and to teach to bring conviction number one and when that conviction comes to say yes i praise the lord that's the way the word of god ought to be and then to lead from conviction to conversion 
and then you are totally converted if you were born again before you say i see that i see that i see that i'll not go that way again from conviction to conversion to consecration you lay everything on the altar again this is how our forefathers did it this is how our teachers this is how the founder of the church and this is how our teacher who has been teaching us every monday all these years this is what he has laid down and i will not meddle with them that are giving to change that's what we're learning about jephthah that he did that by faith if you have faith in god you'll stand by the word of god and you have faith in god i said you have faith in god it will crucify the flesh it will bring down the pride of man or the pride of a woman all the things of the world it will bury everything but you'll stay on this watch i stand if Jephthah could make a vow to the Lord and he could stand by that vow and making a promise to the Lord and I will stand. You will stand. I said you will stand because he had, number one, unwavering faith. That man had unwavering faith. That's what the Lord is calling you to. That you too, you have unwavering faith. Number two, he had uncompromising faithfulness faithful to the lord in little things and in big things you're not uh, doing anything in secret you're not doing anything privately that's okay in the public you do it as everybody in deeper life is doing it and then in the private you're doing another thing on compromising faithfulness and then on fading fruit on fading fruit everybody could see that's why it's reaching down in the word of god that number one you'll be unwavering in your faith on compromising number two on compromising in your faithfulness and by the grace of god number three of fading in your fruit as well we've learned today about gideon about barak about something and about jephthah and the lord is calling us to the faith aspect to the faith life that they live and all their pitfalls and all their faults like something like other people we avoid all that and then we stand with a backbone and we say we're going to follow through and follow god and we're going to be committed consecrated until the very end if that's your mind the lord will help you the grace of god will see you through and your faith in christ will not fail and you will not falter you will not be disappointed in jesus name we're going to rise up and we're going to talk to the lord in prayer and recommit ourselves again unto the lord if the word has come convicting you of something wrong you don't get unhappy because you're under conviction you go to the lord you say lord i see that lord i understand that help me so that i will stand and so that i will not be meddling with people who are giving to change open your mouth and pray and tell the lord oh lord i will stand oh lord i will follow you oh lord i will do your will i'll keep on standing i'll keep on standing keep on standing on this word until the very end and if there are people men or women women leaders men leaders men pastors and women uh, uh, coordinators or whatever who are trying to make you change trying to make you deviate from the word of God and trying to make you mellow down and add this and subtract this and take away this and do this other thing in another way you'll say madam I'm sorry this is my stand sir I am sorry this is where I stand I want to get to heaven I don't want to allow all these things that will make me lose the spirit and make me lose my strength and make me lose my seal and make me lose my security and make me lose my sight and make me lose my self-respect and make me lose my superiority i don't want to be like something i want to stand i want to keep on standing don't allow anything to make you fall don't respect so much somebody so much that is okay because of the respect i have for him because of the respect I have for her, I will backslide. You don't want to do that. Because of the intimacy I have with him, intimacy I have with her, I don't mind. I will lose my soul. You can't do that. Your soul is number one to you. Very important to you. Heaven is number one to you. Very important to you. And your Christian experience, very important to you. You don't want to joke or that play or that gamble or that because of intimacy or because of interaction or because of acquaintance or because of friendship with anybody 
Here I stand. I will not meddle with those who are given to change.